Feynman, who did uh, Bernie Sanders. Huge successor, but uh, I'm the one who occupies his office right now. Um, putting together a program to properly uh, set up a memorial to a man like Hugh Cooper was not only daunting, but I thought it was going to be an impossible task until all of you helped to move this along by sending such great tributes, such wonderful memories. And so, uh, if there's anyone to thank for this tribute, it's all of you. So, please take my heartfelt thanks for that. Um, the passing of Lewis Hugh Cooper hits home every time there is a pursuit event in this hall now, because as all of you who were his students remember, uh, if there was a pursuit event here, you and Nan sat right back there, and everyone knew that they would be there. And strangely enough, about a month after his passing, this hall was redesigned, and so those very chairs that they were sat in are now no longer there. So for once, coincidence is also appropriate. Um, I, we have so much music for you tonight and so many memories that that's all I want to say, other than to introduce my colleague Mark Clay from the musicology department here, who also was a bassoonist and one of those prime examples of the kind of student that uh, Hugh wanted that would do more than just bassoon and end up succeeding at that as well. So Mark Clay. so many familiar faces and to make sort of new friends part of the, uh, the Cooper family, the extended Cooper family. We should acknowledge David Cooper, who I know is here, and other members of the family. Thank you so much for being here. say just a few words to uh, uh, help put things into perspective and in some ways to bring uh, things full circle. Uh, although he looks much older than I do, Paul and I are exact contemporaries. We both grew up in Detroit. Uh, we both began our initial studies with Charlie Surratt uh, when Charlie couldn't stand teaching us anymore and quit teaching completely. 
we both switched to Bob Pfeiffer, who at the time was the concert player in the Detroit Symphony. Pfeiffer was a student of Hughes uh, here in the, the late 1940s and early 50s. He was not a concert player. Uh, when the contra vacancy opened in the Detroit Symphony, Hugh had to talk him into taking the audition, and then spent six weeks teaching him how to play the contra bassoon, well enough for him to actually win that audition. Uh, Pfeiffer went on to a 30-year career as the contra bassoon player with the Philadelphia Orchestra. Um, Paul and I both started here at Michigan in 1960. Paul uh, was not a music major, but uh, studied with Coop and uh, uh, played in the band. And in fact, Paul was a member of the band that uh, did the famous 16-week uh, tour of uh, uh, Russia and the Middle East. I was not uh, so fortunate due to my own foolishness <coughs> in some ways, but uh, Paul's career and my career kind of followed each other along for many years. We were both former members of the Toledo Orchestra, the Dallas Symphony, and the Detroit Symphony, although we never played many of those orchestras at the same time. Um, a word about the bassoon. I'm playing on uh, Hughes' fabulous 8000 series Heckle. Uh, this is the bassoon that he purchased from Charlie Serrard in the 1940s, the late 1940s. Uh, Charlie was the original owner and had purchased it through his teacher, Simon Kovar. Kovar, in 1938, had arranged for three bassoons, three new heckles to come in. He imported three new heckles for his students, the other two, three identical heckles. Uh, the other two instruments went to Stephen Maxson and Leonard Sherrill. So I feel particularly uh, uh, thrilled and blessed and honored to be playing on this instrument. Uh, one final word, we'll be joined in the Weissenborn Trio after this by Vicki King. Uh, Vicki was a high school student of mine, uh, and then uh, after that uh, studied here with Cooper, and then went on to a career in the Detroit Symphony. She's been second to soon in the Detroit Symphony, longer than Cooper and I together.
part-time bassoon professor who concurrently played in the Detroit Symphony, along with my horn teacher, Ted Evans. All of my friends who were bassoon majors took great joy and pride in studying with you, and the progress was evident even to this lowly undergraduate. When I came on the faculty in 1975, I was immediately struck by the fact that Hugh knew everything about the bassoon, bassoon repair, Baroque and classic and era embellishments, acoustics, in addition to having an encyclopedic knowledge of how the School of Music worked, the history of all the committees, as well as the mores of the faculty. Anytime I needed to know anything, I went to Hugh. He always helped me and was a source of knowledge on so many subjects I will always be appreciative. Occasionally, I would come to my office early, early in the morning for something I needed to do, and I assumed that I would be the first one there. Not so. Invariably, Hugh was already there in his studio working on someone's bassoon. Did he really get any sleep at all? There was no faculty member who attended more concerts than Hugh, and most often Nan as well. They sat in the same seats over at the side of the hill. They were there to support the students, and the students and I appreciated it greatly. It became evident early on that Nan especially liked marches. And often, when we performed marches, I would make sure that Hugh let Nan know that marches would be on the concert. If they weren't, I heard about them, always with a smile. But I knew what was expected, and I tried to comply as much as possible, but not enough for Nan. I miss you very much, and am in his debt for all that he gave me in support, knowledge, and affirmation. His students to this day speak of him in reverence, and justly so. He has provided a terrific example for all of us to follow. Sincerely, Bob. Next performer is Yoshi Shikawa from the University of Kano. If I recall, he was about somewhere in the middle of the book. Ever since my, my association with Hugh, I have tried to live by his principles that he demonstrated to me through his work. I appreciate that Hugh has shown me the path that has indeed led me to be where I am today.
I didn't know this man until a few months ago when we first started talking about uh, this event, and I realized that uh, he and you have something in common, which is the ability to tell a story. So we couldn't have an event like this without participation of Howard Tennyson.
about preparation and sufficient think time, he said, do not today that which can be done tomorrow. On good business practice, he would say, vacillating prices are the best way to lose customer confidence. Regarding performance, especially on the bassoon, he believed that job number one was get the note, job number two, do something with it. On the subject of long-term investment, his thinking was stocks, bonds, and paper investments could not be trusted. Only hard assets would give reliable results. His own solution was buy two heckle bassoons each year, put them away, and then you have the financial security you needed for retirement. <laughs> Regarding personal privacy, Mr. Cooper felt anyone who maintains his superior position by utilizing a secret will not remain in first place very long. I would like to share with you two personal experiences which will give a glimpse into Mr. Cooper's humor and insight. Sometime in my second year of bassoon study, I went, as I normally did, to take my lesson and play my assignments. It must have been an off day. I was a good clarinetist and a promising bassoon student, so I thought. At some point, Mr. Cooper stopped me and said, get the heck out of my office and don't come back. <laughs> he said he was tired of listening to mistakes and I was wasting his time. If I ever did come back, he didn't care what I would play, but it better be right. I have never been the same person since that day. What became clear was, excellence is a state of mind, not merely a question of ability. I believe he did me a big favor that day. The next story I have concerns read making. Hugh Cooper gave classes to all of his students at some point each year. Students like myself would try our luck and play the reads at our lessons. Mr. Cooper would then comment on the quality and craftsmanship of our handiwork. Sometimes he would say, this one is not too bad. Let me see if I can do something with it over the next week. He would then reach up and place the reed on top of the file cabinet next to his chair. And usually that was the last I ever saw of that reed. <laughs> <coughs> One night, while I was a resident at South Park River, I received a call at about 1.30 a.m. from a worried bassoon student. He needed a reed right away for a recital. Would I make one for him? I said, ask Cooper to help. His are the best reads there are. This fellow then proceeded to tell me that the University of Michigan Woodman Quintet had played a concert at Rackham Hall that evening, and he went back to see Mr. Cooper after the concert. Mr. Cooper told this fellow to call me. He said that he had been using my reads for over a year. <laughs> whereby I would not have to take any secondary instrument 
which I could pass off with an addition, or audition. That summer, I studied what I could with the help of my father and passed off the trumpet, trombone, oboe, and the flute. When I got to the bassoon audition, and after playing for Mr. Cooper, he said I was doing everything incorrectly, and in a clear conscience, he could not pass me out of the bassoon. He did, however, recommend that I take private lessons on the bassoon with him. Fortunately, I was able to accomplish enough in one semester so that he agreed to my request to change my major instrument from clarinet to bassoon. Because I had to make up for the 10 years of lessons I never had, I needed to write down all the new fingerings in order to remember everything I had to know. Having been inspired to continue my master's degree, one of the required courses was instrumental methods. One assignment was to obtain a good fingering chart for each wind instrument. At the time, no such correct chart existed for the bassoon. I then made up one based upon Hugh Cooper's correct fingerings. As a seventh year student, I was not shy, and I asked Dr. Emil Holtz, our instructor, if this chart would be useful for the class. He said it definitely would be, and I made some ditto copies for him to distribute. About a month later, Dr. Hall stopped me in the hall and said, Toplonsky, the world has been waiting for a book on how to play the bassoon. Your chart is a good beginning, and I want you to do this as a master's degree thesis. I will try to arrange a fellowship and have Cooper agreed to assist in the project. It turned out that no fellowship was available since I had already begun my degree program and only new candidates are eligible for such aid. My father agreed to help out because he thought the idea of this book was a good one. The following school year, we began the design of the pages and the accumulation of the information. The irony of this project is that it could only be done it could only come about due to the absence of technology. In 1968, there were no copiers, computers, music software, printers, or any other type of graphic reproduction other than offset printing. All of the artwork was done by hand, including the notes and dots on each page, and each page was offset printed separately. The huge expense of more than $10,000 in 10, 1968 currency required that the book be published and sold to defray the cost. Today, because of technological advances, there would only be six copies in existence. One for the teacher, two for the student, two for the library, and one for the department. This volume would have never seen the light of day and would be lost forever. This project was not an easy task. Hugh Cooper and I had some disputes from time to time, but they were all resolved congenially, and Essentials of the Soon Technique is now completing its 40th year. Mr. Cooper believed that this book would change the bassoon world. Prior to the advent of Essentials of the Soon Technique, a bassoonist needed 25 years to accumulate the necessary information to play a complete repertoire presented by a major symphony orchestra. The soonest of the day would share fingerings with each other and keep them in a notebook nearby at all times. Now, a high school bassoonist would have more information available at the beginning than most bassoonists had at the end of their professional careers. Hugh Cooper believed this would raise the level of bassoon proficiency around the world. He did feel that while we might become famous, we would never get rich unless we gave the book a title like Sex and the Single Bassoonist. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke to Mr. Cooper several months before he left us, and he said he believed that essential to bassoon technique was probably the closest that he would ever come to accomplishing something which was perfect. He also made some remarks of extraordinary affection for me and believed that he, because he was by nature a procrastinator, he would have never created such a work by himself. What in effect actually happened was the meeting of two mad scientists 
with a common musical purpose who arrived at the same place at the same time. I am grateful for having had the chance to be part of something that makes a real difference. Lewis Hugh Cooper will be missed by all, however, future generations of bassoon players will benefit from his having been here for so many of us. I will leave you with this thought that Lewis Hugh Cooper was one of those special individuals who made the University of Michigan one of the greatest places on earth. Thank you.
nice to read about the Cooper and Bassoon and learn the name of Hugh Cooper in magazine instrumentals. Fast forward way now to 1988, and this is, uh, I call this episode, My Introduction to the IBRS. I had already been in Ann Arbor and the University of Med Med Michigan Medical Faculty for six years, and I decided to get back into playing bassoon after an 18 year hiatus. I phoned you who invited me to a studio here in the music building. Immediately, the perceptive, warm, open, and cordial, and it's as though we had been lifelong friends. Within about five minutes of my arrival at the studio, he told me about the International Double Read Society, gave me a few back issues of the double read which he, which he had on hand, along with an IDRS application. I think I joined that week. This little episode was called Short Visits. My wife and I learned quickly that a drive over to see Coop for a few minutes would usually last for quite late. He was a fountain of knowledge about many things, and he always was willing to share and to help, so my wife didn't have to bother to keep waiting up for me. The perfectionist in Hans Menning. Coop always spoke with such reference uh, about Hans Menning, the legendary woodwind repair person in Philadelphia. And uh, a few years ago, uh, you told me that one of his proudest days was when Menning looked at it assumed that, that he'd been working on, that you had worked on. I don't know, he prepared and voiced it combination. And then he just looked up and said, this, this, this is great work. He said, there's nothing else I can do to improve on it. And when Coop told me this story, uh, even though it was 50 years later, it was very moving because he had a lump in his throat. And when he told me the story, he was so proud of this uh, official blessing that I received from Manny. And you could really see that it, it still touched him after a half century. The road trip. Great memory I have is when I drove you from Ann Arbor to uh, Madison, Wisconsin for a double B meeting a few years back. Alvin Swing, who's a friend of mine, another uh, fairly well-known double repair, read repair person, heard that I was going to be driving to and he is a great admirer of you, Cooper. He told me, bring a paper recorder, turn it on, and just let Coop talk to the whole thing. <laughs> well, I didn't have a recorder to bring with me, but it really was the fastest drive I ever had uh, over such a you know, a fair distance. I never exceeded the speed limit, even had a traffic jam outside Chicago, but Coop was just such a fountain of knowledge, and I tried to soak up everything that he said on that trip. When it got quiet, uh, Coop just, I just asked him another question, and he was off again. <laughs> and later on, I, I wrote down as much as I recall, and those of you who know me, I, I pretty much take notes on everything, and, and uh, that's how I got all this information. I had, in preparation for this road trip, I had dubbed a cassette and of the first movement of the, the Mozart Bassoon Concerto. I had eight different renditions, eight different artists, and we listened to it while we were driving. And I didn't have played a little game, I didn't tell who, who it was, who each one was. And he really enjoyed listening to it. He made critiques, and he didn't know who was performing, but sometimes he did figure out uh, what country the person probably was from or what era. It was probably from based on either how the bassoon sound or the style of which was played. Then when we revealed who the artist was, he, he uh, really enjoyed this little game and talked about it for several years later. Always a student. You was always curious and questioning. I don't think he ever took anything for granted. He always wanted to learn about so much. And I found that much of his leisure reading was about science, which he really loved to discuss with me and with other scientists, physicians, musicians, uh, associates that, that he had and with, with whom he had conversations. If you go to the, uh, the Double Read site, uh, there's an archive there with, uh, with audio recordings. And fortunately, we have an interview, a telephone interview by Terry Ewell with Coop, um, you know, who was soon before he passed away, but we're just so lucky to have that audio archive. And in that, Coop just said how much he, he expected his bassoon students to ask questions to try to understand the music, to understand the bassoon, the read, and to know why things work and why things are done. I think as full-time students can address this more completely, but you really want your students to learn how to identify and isolate problems and how to find solutions in a very thoughtful way. I find it very interesting, we heard the story of, of the book, and it was uh, wonderful hearing all that, but uh, as authoritative as it was, I find it very interesting and, and very telling that they left some blank pages because Coop, I think, knew that the answers weren't all in. There's more answers to be found. People find their own solutions, and they purposely left some portions of the book you could put in your own little fingers. 
And I think that was very telling about how he thought. I call this little thing analytical. Some claim that it, that if it were possible, and perhaps he did it hearing uh, what Mr. Tuplansky was saying, if it were possible, Cook might have used a slide rule for later calculated green lessons as he was a very analytical person. But I, I thought that his analytical way of thinking was not really an end in itself, nor did I ever think that he was being pedantic. He, he just never took things for granted or at face value. He was always questioning. And, and I think this was very much as better scientists are taught to do and, and as they do. And Coop used to like for his leisure reading, as I said, read about scientists and things that they're working on. He wanted students to listen critically, to understand the music and their instrument, recognize the problem, and have an approach to solve it. Isolating the elements of the problem, working on it part by part, slowly and methodically. methodically. He, but he knew that success in the end would be judged by the musical result. The proof was, was in the product. As any great teacher, Coop admitted that, uh, that it's great, good students make good teachers. And he, he, he knew that. And he said he was very fortunate to have some very good students. The lesson. What I remember, and I think this was his pattern over the years, Coop would sit on your right and have his yellow legal pen and pencil close in hand. I had made a stamp for him, um, so that he only needed to stamp the paper if he wanted to overfilling and then just fill it in. And I gave him an ink pad and bought him a pack of yellow pads. I thought it was a kind of cute little present. He appreciated it, but the next lesson, which in my case was really some months later, there he was again drawing out the fingerings the way he had done for decades. So I guess his long head method for him was tried and true, and that's what he enjoyed doing. Share. Coop was always willing to give his time to share his knowledge and expertise. Uh, one story was very interesting. He told me that although he had almost six decades or so of working, a working relationship with the Kupner family and with their bassoons, he was actually friends with many bassoon manufacturers. Uh, he told me a story that one time a, quote, rival manufacturer had a problem at their factory, and they had lost all their reamers, the important tools for working on the bore uh, of the bassoon. Coop happened to have a set himself, and he just selflessly lent them to this competitive company to let them get started again. He did admit, though, that this became a permanent loan. He never sold the again. <laughs> Several years ago at an IBRS meeting, there was a manufacturer um, who was getting started in bassoon production. They, they did have a name in other instruments, but really not in bassoon. And actually, the bassoon did not play very well at all. But once again, uh, Coop spent some time with them. And right there at their booth, made a few adjustments, made some suggestions, which actually were very helpful. And I, I think just this really shows his, his very sharing of uh, his nature. How do we refer to him? Well, his, his I call this Cooper you. He always referred to himself either if this is Coop or this is you when you call. And for me, at least, that's how he has to be addressed. You'll notice even this evening that his students always speak with great reverence and very deserved reverence as Professor Cooper and Mr. Cooper. I had some grammatical discomfort because on the telephone I, I always felt a little awkward when Nan answered the phone and then I said, is you there? It didn't quite sound right. <laughs> the wink, I'll call this. Uh, three little instances when you gave me this little telling wink that, like, you know, like, like was letting me on to something. Uh, I had been bugging him for a long time to, to be able to hear him actually play. At the time I was working with him, he didn't play in the lessons. Uh, I could listen to those wonderful uh, Mercury Living Presence recordings, and knowing the part, knowing that he was the second bassoonist, I could figure very often in exposed portions what was him. But I really wanted to hear something with him. And finally, he, he did uh, dig out a tape which he played for me in his house. I think it was the U of M Living Quintet. This was from many years ago. And there was one portion that had a technical that a lot of notes going very quickly. And he just looked at me and gave me the wink, and really he was saying, see, I could play. <laughs> this other thing with the wink was regarding a story he told me about the frozen bassoon joint. He said one time he got a telephone call um, from a, a parent who was quite frantic because they had, had this kid's bassoon put together and they couldn't get it apart. Obviously, there must have been a change in the humidity or the temperature or something. So he said, well, you know, just come over and, and I'll help you with it. Well, they show up, this, I think it was a little girl, and he said, and his father was this big guy, he must have been a truck driver or something like that. And this guy had tried everything, couldn't get it. Coop just took it and he had it apart in like 
two seconds. And the guy just looked at him, and he said he was almost in tears. He didn't lose tears because he was grateful, or tears like, why is this guy just getting his size able to do this? Who told me the secret? What he did is he just took it, he put it across his knee, and he just moved it just a couple of microns. It was enough to break the vacuum seal, and therefore it just came apart. So obviously, Coop's knowledge of science and can fit right in. Finally, the last little link episode is one I had written about is, is about the torch. And, uh, and some of you, if you hadn't worked on your bassoon, and you know he was really uh, an expert on sealing the bassoon and making sure you didn't have any leaks. And one area you can often leak is the bottom of the boot joint. And uh, so he was just looking at it. I really hadn't asked him to do anything, but he decided, let me just have a look at your horn, see what's going on. He did his vacuum test. He said, excuse me, I can make this a little bit better. Pulls the cup off the boot joint. He says, well, let's work on this. I'm going to put some paraffin in, into the wood to seal it. Then he lights up a uh, propane torch. And next thing you know, the propane torch is on my bassoon. So I have a 9,000 heckle, and he's there, and he's, he's frying this thing. But uh, <laughs> there was the wink again, because he knew what I was reacting to. Because I didn't trust him. But he knew exactly when to pull away. He'd eat the wood, and then the uh, paraffin on the spatula would go right in. But obviously, he'd done this several times. And, uh, and it was something to see. <laughs> Finally, uh, teachers and students. I, I always thought that Coop was a very modest person. He, he, he knew what he knew, and he knew what he was doing, and that he was successful as a teacher. Yet, as I said before, he always acknowledged that it's good students that make good teachers, and so he didn't want to take you know, too much credit. Finally, in closing, I, I think Coop would have liked seeing everyone at this event, although I think he might have felt a little uncomfortable about being the center of attention. And uh, I think his students, the, the, the long the longevity and, and future of the book, his writings, which are now even more so being compiled into, and, you know, into other books by former students, uh, this will all ensure that, that uh, Coop's enthusiasm about music and about the bassoon will live on. Uh, those of us who knew him personally are very fortunate. The University of Michigan is very fortunate that he was and will remain one of its own. Thank you. scheduled to play again in July in Provo, Utah. Our performance will not be as great as I just told you.
And when I landed here in Ann Arbor, uh, it, was, it was quote unquote Cooper country. And that's the way I really kind of felt. I mean, all of the teachers at the, uh, the state universities here were Cooper students. The, the local orchestras were all Cooper students. Everybody here was uh, playing uh, Cooper Cooper bassoons. I came in with a heckle, and I, and I really, like I said, I fell out of place, but I was wondering why was I playing on this instrument and everybody else was playing on the other instrument. Um, so, as we developed our relationship in my one on one instruction, my second year here, I was fortunate to have been bassoon TA. And so, the summer prior, I put together some handouts that I felt that I should be giving out to my students that I would be teaching. And of course, uh, we needed his approval, so I asked him to look through the, the handouts, and he, he liked what he saw, but started making modifications and corrections. And as we started, we worked on that through that next year, and then I went out and took a, 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 a faculty teaching position, I started, kept thinking about that whole uh, putting together something, and his relationship to that. I thought about the essentials of uh, Zoom technique, and I finally approached uh, Hugh and said, you know, we need to put some of this down into, into print. This was 1987. As you can tell, the document is still not published. <laughs> when we talked about doing it, uh, uh, I finally uh, seen Howard Duplansky here for the first time. I remember Hugh talked about that, and stories get changed around. I'm not sure if it's my memory or his memory, too, and I'd like to talk to Howard about this a little bit. But when we talked about uh, starting this project, he said, I work fast. I recall that uh, when I worked on the essentials, we worked around the clock, and uh, that Howard would put uh, some of those sheets with the fingerings in my mailbox. I picked them up at night, stayed up for quite a bit of the night, uh, modified it, made any changes to them, added some new things, put them back in the mailbox, and we had this cycle going, picking things up, and it got published, we got done with it very quickly. So when you're asking me to work on something, be prepared to work hard and get this done quickly. We're 20 years down the road here. Um, I met tonight with Mark Clay, and we, I have a, a, a manuscript that is about 168 pages, exactly, actually, with uh, 67 diagrams in their illustration, and we're ready to put it on to a, to a publisher. So, as you know, in a publishing business, that takes quite a bit of time to publish. Number one, we've got to get it accepted, too, of course. But hopefully some of this writing finally does actually uh, get into print. Um, when I did the illustrations with you, and uh, Michael was talking about all those yellow notepads, I have boxes and boxes at home of yellow notepads that we corresponded with over the years to put together this document. When I would look at the diagrams and wanted me to, uh, to put into a digitized format, I needed to learn Illustrator and got into graphics business, and the reads needed to be literally as perfect as uh, what he drew on his, on his yellow notepads, which he was obviously a very good artist and felt that we all should be very good artists and impressed that upon him in his lesson. Um, what I would do is I would uh, measure up his hand-drawn uh, images and would then put them in, blow up the, the Illustrator program to like, you know, maybe 800 times so I could get into a real detail and then after I printed them out, I would hold them up against his hand drawings, because I knew if they weren't exactly matched to his hand drawings, he would return them and ask me to keep working on them. So uh, I hope that the, the drawings and things came out as good as what he would uh, have liked. Um, I feel very fortunate to have been uh, a, one of his students. I'm always proud to mention to anybody that I'm a Hugh Cooper student. And I feel fortunate to have spent time here in Ann Arbor working with him. But the time that I've had away from the, uh, from the school here, actually, these last number of years, uh, have been uh, very wonderful. And I feel that uh, he's taught me a lot uh, about how he, how he thinks, which has impacted how I think. Um, and I uh, really uh, cherish all my time that I had with him, and I miss him dearly, and um, keep smiling.
Thank you so, so much for coming tonight and for sitting here through a, a concert that everybody's celebrating. And uh, the speeches have been fantastic. I, mean, I know you would have probably benefited from an intermission, but we, we really anticipate that the enthusiasm, well, we should have anticipated the enthusiasm of the speech. We have a reception right after in the rehearsal hall, which is just down here to the right, which you have the door. Um, we also have one final speaker, um, a voice you'll recognize. One of the things I've been doing at the university is an oral history project, and I had the pleasure of assigning several of my students at various times to interview Professor Cooper. So I've made a little collage out of some of those interview tapes, um, primarily from a student named Nathaniel Zeisser, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight because he's playing with the Toledo Symphony. For some reason, a lot of orchestras have concerts on Saturday nights, so and they didn't cancel them, but I decided to know why. Next time, I think we'll, we'll make sure that the orchestras have an evening on. Um, we'll make lots of friends with our colleagues in the spring sessions, I'm sure. But anyway, um, I just want to leave the final word to Hugh Cooper. I graduated from high school in 38, all right? And uh, at that time, most of my colleagues that were in the Pontiac school system. Dale Harris was the conductor of the bands there and superb music education program, one of the best that ever existed in the country, both orchestra and band. And uh, anyhow, all of my buddies uh, were going to Michigan State and uh, had scholarship offers and so on. And I also had a full scholarship uh, to Michigan State offered and uh, uh, a living stipend, not complete, but right. extra money. And that was awfully tempting. But anyhow, Dale Harris, in his wisdom, uh, said uh, something to the effect that, well, if you're really interested in music as a career, I would suggest that you, you think seriously of the University of Michigan. Now, this is in uh, 1938. Ravelli had come to Michigan in, in 35. And uh, so anyhow, Dale drove me over my, uh, himself in his personal car. And at that time, the band hall was uh, the old Morris Hall where Jefferson Street came out on the State Street and Ravelli's office was uh, upstairs and I went in and I played for Ravelli and he uh, listened to me play and he said, well, I, I think we can use you, you. He said, I, I think we can use you. And so anyhow, uh, this was the end of the Great Depression and I didn't know anybody who had any money. <laughs> money was a strange thing, right? Yeah. You know, and, uh, so anyhow, he, he was relatively new here. He didn't have any scholarship funds at all. And he said, uh, uh, are you going to need financial assistance? And I said, yeah, I'm afraid you will. And he said, uh, well, would you be willing to, to work for Gordon Rowe? And I said, sure. So he picked up the phone and uh, somehow or other, he had already developed a network and he had people and this happened to be Stan Waltz, who was then the head of the Michigan Union. Uh, on, well, it's still there. Yeah, right? yeah. And uh, he picked up the phone, called Stan Waltz, and said, uh, I have a young man here who's going to need some help to go to school. Do you have anything that you could offer him? And uh, so at the other end of the phone, I assumed, he said, you know, send him over to see me when you're through. So I went over, and uh, uh, he offered me a a job in the Union Dining Room, uh, working as a waiter. Well, I've never worked as a waiter before, uh -huh. but anyhow, it was a job. Uh -huh. So, uh, and again, with the guidance of Dale Harris, and he again uh, said, well, uh, I think if you're serious about music, this is the place to go. So instead of accepting the Michigan State offer, I came here. And I can say without equivocation, if I had not made that decision, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. I would not have uh, played the Detroit Symphony. I would not have uh, done a lot of the things that's associated with the career that I've had. Uh, I think the point is, you have to be ready for opportunities. Mm -hmm. But by the same token, uh, the best laid plans of mice and men off go astray, you know. I had moved from the Ann Arbor area uh, to Pontiac because I was thought I was going to be inducted into the service and the wife and two kids, we wanted to get close to our family. And uh, Dale, Harris, uh, Dale Harris was the band conductor 
and he had invited Ravelli in the band, the Michigan band, over for a concert. Well, I was working the night shift in the medical department for, for General Motor Fisher Body, and I couldn't make the concert, so I went down in the afternoon and uh, listened to the rehearsal of the band. And uh, afterwards, the Ravelli said, that we're going to lunch. Would you like to join us? And I said, well, sure. So Ravelli and I were walking down Unit Street, and Pontiac says, what are you doing now? And I said, well, I just auditioned for the Detroit Symphony and, and I'm accepted. I start the, the season. Oh, I said, oh, good. I can use you as a regular faculty member now. Would you be interested? And I said, well, yeah, sure. He said, I'll talk with the dean when I get back. So about two or three days later, I get a nice letter from uh, then Dean Moore uh, offering me a part-time appointment. I, obviously, I accepted. When <laughs> students would come in griping about Bill Ravelli and his tactics, you know, mm -hmm. I say, come here, man. This after we moved into a new building, and I take them over to a wall and I say, look at that brick. I said, yeah. I said, look closer, really close. What do you see down there in the lower right hand corner of that brick? Nothing. You got to look closer. <laughs> Finally, I say. It says William T. Ravelli, because if it wasn't for him, this damn school wouldn't even be here. And it's true. It's true. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think I knew Bill Ravelli as well as anybody because I was around him. And uh, there were a lot of things you could uh, object to in his tactics. Mm -hmm. But I'd also tell him, you know, if you don't emulate 90% of his uh, tactics, you're not going to be successful in this business. There was a point in time after I'd been on the faculty a number of years, uh, an incident had happened, and I said, geez, they're, they're really going to start stressing degrees around here. I, I don't even have a bachelor. <laughs> so I went over to see the then uh, associate dean, Wallace, and the old music school office was over on Meander Street. Uh, I wanted to find out what I would have to do to complete my degree program because I dropped out of school during the war years. Mm -hmm. uh, I was working the night shift at the Ford Moore Car Company. I went to work at 11 o'clock at night, working till 7 in the morning, coming back and going to school in the daytime. And uh, I went over to the health service, and Dr. Grace was the doctor that was in the, the band doctor. And he said, what have you been doing to you? And so I told him what I was doing working with. And I was also teaching uh, for Dale Harris and Pontiac uh, on Saturdays. So I got to bed two nights a week, that was all. And uh, he checked me out for reflexes, I didn't have any. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, he went over to his desk and he got his prescription pad out and he said, he's gonna give me some uppers that get me to an exam period anyhow. And he tears it off and hands it to me and it said, either quit work and go to school or quit school and go to work. You cannot do both anymore. That was it. So I dropped out. It was about three weeks before exam period. And so then it was another, what, 17 years or so until, until I actually got the degree. But anyhow, Dean Wallace said, well, we'll get your transcript. And he sent out to get the transcript, and his secretary came back and said, I can't find it. He said, how long has it been since you've been in school? So I cited that too for roughly, oh, he said, your records are over in the alumni building. We'll have to send over and get them out. Could you come in next week again? And I said, yeah, sure. So the following week, I go back to the dean's office, and, and he had his transcript there. And he said, do you? He said, you've got 140 some hours credit. He said, I, but I don't see any, any credit on here in your major instrument. And he said, why? And I said, because I was teaching. <laughs> <laughs> You can't very well study with yourself, can you? And I said, no. And he said, well, what we've decided to do is to give you, grant you 16 hours of credit on Basum, on your transcript, and, uh, and give you your bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. And is that all right with you? And I said, yeah. I said, what do I have to do to get a master's? <laughs>
rehearsal hall where we have a reception waiting. And uh, don't forget your name, Alex, because you won't need them. And I thought there was no better way to uh, do the final tribute to Gene's legacy by showing the next generation with uh, current universal machines in the studio. 